I'm just so pleased to be here with um, the EBBF crew and, and just to meet all of some of you for the first time and uh, to, to, to see some of you again. Very exciting to have you here, Emily, uh, today. So just a brief introduction for the one that do not know you and feel free to add anything. Uh, so you're born in, in Melbourne, Australia, and currently you are based in, uh, in New York where you, have, you are a sustainable investment uh, professional, uh, executive vice president and chief responsible investment officer at Calvert Research and Management. But uh, you have a very international experience you have studied in Oxford um, as a lawyer uh, in Baker and McKinsey. You have also worked in various legal and human rights coordinated uh, and authored uh, Australia's NGO report to the UN Women's Rights Commission. So it's a very exciting background you are bringing into the table today. And uh, I would love to open up the uh, the room. For me, I know that my concept of what's meaningful, at least to me, when it comes to work has changed over 35 years. Um, how's your idea, concept of what's meaningful to you when it comes to, you know, the work you do changed over time? Thanks, Mark. That's a really wonderful question. Um, so um, I think that that is a really, it's a really important question because obviously what we think is a meaningful career is is tied to what we think is a meaningful life. And as you go through life, your experiences shift and, and inform, your experiences inform and shift what you think a meaningful life looks like. Uh, so certainly I would say, I would think about this in terms of time for myself. So when I was younger, uh, I was very focused on social justice and human rights issues. I was very interested in justice issues. Um, as growing up during apartheid era, you know, in South Africa and seeing that, seeing that uh, change very dramatically when I was very young and impressionable and then seeing the fall of the Berlin Wall and just being very, growing up very aware of uh, different social movements and uh, injustices that were existed in the world and feeling motivated and I think having the encouragement of my parents to focus on that as a as a ethos for how I would contribute to the world in some way and um, for me that meant in, in the younger years human rights and uh, social justice NGOs and so when I went through my university and was trying to set up for, you know, how am I going to make a contribution to these areas that I felt passionately about, I was very focused on getting into the, uh, the law field, uh, doing a law degree, and then finding a pathway into something to do with law and human rights. And then it shifted into international development um, as I was going through my university studies. And I tried to pursue that. I did like a ton of different, uh, internships and experiences with different NGOs. I worked in um, a disadvantaged uh, kind of public interest law and, and uh, disadvantaged um, you know, legal services for disadvantaged or marginalized groups, including the Tahare Justice Center in the US and then uh, the Homeless Persons Legal Clinic in Melbourne, which was a, a, a real um, kind of advance for its time uh, in terms of legal services for that population. And, all of my role models uh, in the law uh, advised that if you really want to make a be an excellent lawyer and defend the rights of marginalized people, you really need to go to a corporate law firm and get your training there. And I followed that advice, um, you know, took it to heart and diligently followed that advice and did everything, everything I could to position as someone who was going to be acceptable to a corporate law firm and um, Kind of get into that whole world and I thought well even though this this might be I'm, in, I'm, I'm ultimately inspired by this broader vision of social change actually I'm, I'm interested in power generally and I think understanding power and the exertion of power through being in the legal in the legal field uh, would be very useful and informative and I was very open to eventually becoming a law firm partner and kind of having an influence that way and then over the course of being in the law firm, realized that law is actually quite a specific skill and there are some people who are very talented at it and I wasn't necessarily going to be the most talented lawyer, although I could do it. 
And I think it really opened up a lot of questions for me around um, contrasting the private legal practice from my NGO experiences. I felt a real tension between, on the one side in the, in the NGO human rights field, a lot of um, constraint around resources. So a huge vision of impact and change in these organizations, but always a constraint on resources that would dictate how the projects, which projects would get picked up and how long they would run for, generally only a year. And there'd be all this reporting to donors. And I saw over, over the years how kind of what was in vogue with donors would massively shift how funding was allocated to different issues around the world. One year it was Timor, East Timor. The next year it was Banda Aceh. Like this money would just move around and it seemed like a very um, unsustainable way of fostering social change. On the other hand, in the private law firm, tons of resources, like incredible amounts of money going into investment funds that we were establishing and listings and sale of assets, but not a vision of how any of it interconnected with a broader environmental social vision of, of progress for humanity. And so I started to become interested in creating meaning in my career in the private sector where you could marry together the commitment to um, social and environmental change, progress, um, unity in whatever way you want to phrase that and the scale and power of the private sector. And I started to think about that, you know, around, you know, the late 2000s as I was uh, come, finishing up my legal career. And then from there, I suppose I became a much more, um, much more nuanced mark in my, in my feeling about what I thought a meaningful career could look like. And I really opened myself up to the private sector in a way when I was much younger, I was very hard line about it, very black and white about it. And if you'd ever told me that, well, Emily, you'll end up working for this division of a really large kind of global Wall Street bank, which is Morgan Stanley. So Morgan Stanley is the, the parent company for um, Harvard Research and Management. I would have like laughed in your face and said, no way, <laughs> I'm, not joining. I'm not joining Wall Street. But um, the reality is that maybe, and maybe it's the time in which I've been born, I've been able to grow at a time when I think the fundamental assumptions around what's right and wrong, what's kind of positive and negative is becoming a lot more nuanced as the world becomes a lot more um, global, uh, as communities become more diverse, as systemic issues, the kind of crisis that we're in around different systemic issues becomes a lot more apparent. Um, I think it's clear now that every institution and every um, kind of every sphere of human endeavor has a role to play in uh, addressing the human crises that we face today. I mean, your um, definition of meaningful career has changed, right? As you said at the beginning, according to your definition of meaningful life. And I give for granted that your definition of success has changed throughout your career, how it has changed. And if you can have this type of conversation, in your industry as well, about definition of success with your clients, with your team, and if you can inspire them? I mean, I think the definition of career success is, you know, it's, it's not only, um, oh, achieving seniority or achieving impact and influence. I think it's also, are you living a life that you are happy with, right? And, and obviously the work that you're doing is an integrated part of that. And we spend so much time working in our lives that I think it's important that whatever you do and the people you're doing it with, you feel like they're your friends and you feel like the, the content of what you do is intellectually engaging and interesting to you. And the actual activities that you're doing are inherently satisfying to you in some way because you're going to be spending a lot of time doing it, like <laughs> whatever it is. Um, and so you don't want it to feel like, well, you know, that, career success is somehow in opposition to my kind of life success, I suppose. But then I think as I've grown um, professionally, I think my definition of career success, I think that we can be a little bit too atomized or individualistic also in, in the way we think about career success, that it's somehow about a title or it's about me and my individual you know, accolades or whatever. I, I'm increasingly have an aversion to all of that. I mean, even doing this webinar, I feel a bit like, you know, oh, like <laughs> in the set of attention, but actually everything that I think I've ever achieved, if I've achieved anything, 
has been as a result of working in a team with other fantastic people. So I think career success is very much tied to, you know, how are you channeling your energies in collaboration with others to build something that is lasting in its impact and which is making a net positive contribution. And your ability to work with others, whether they're your direct employees or direct reports, or whether they're your clients, or whether they're other stakeholders in an ecosystem of influence, um, to me, success is defined much more about the success of those relationships today than whatever might be conjured by a particular title. And I, I don't know if you are planning a career move right now, but uh, Johan is wondering what would be your ideal next career move that integrates all of your past experiences in terms of organization, positions, responsibility. Well, I feel very lucky that um, the role that I'm in right now, which I've relatively recently um, grown into, is actually, I feel it does integrate all of my past experiences right now. Um, I'm working for Calvert Research and Management, which has a 40 year history in the responsible investment field. So a gold plated kind of original <laughs> firm that's been operating in this space since the 1980s. Um, that means that we have built a, a loyal uh, uh, following and, and client uh, base, particularly among US retail investors because not only are we providing investment solutions that generate attractive returns, but we're very authentic in our commitment to a, vis a vision of positive change. And we have the track record to back that up. Uh, it's not a recent thing for us. You can see it in our, um, the way, the companies that we invest in, you can see it in the way that we speak to those companies and advocate for positive change at those companies, uh, positive change that is good for planet, good for people, but also good for the investors and for the company over the long term. And you can see it in our proxy voting record as well. So the way in which we hold management teams accountable uh, to certain um, norms of good governance and uh, emerging norms around environmental and social management. So I actually feel like I'm in the perfect spot right now to, to integrate my, 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 and it's taken a while, you know, to get to this, to get to this spot, but I'm super excited about the opportunity ahead of us at Calvert and uh, the inflection point that we're really, I feel that we're at in the capital markets where I think that there is a lot of attention being paid now uh, to this concept of externalities, like the, the concept that environmental and social resources or factors or risks were ever externalized from the management of a corporation. I think that's being fundamentally challenged right now. Uh, it's been challenged not only by the investment community, but also by regulators. And I think uh, in a world where governments are increasingly um, hamstrung or appear to be ineffective in the face of global crises. I think even more attention is being spent by the public on corporate leaders to fill a void of authentic moral and ethical leadership as we uh, kind of go into a period of, of rapid change. So um, I think that, I think that, um, uh, I think this concept of spiritual capital um, is an interesting one. It's not one that I hear very much in my space. Certainly the concern with ESG greenwashing is there. Uh, I think that that is a, I don't think that that's necessarily uh, inherent to the field or to the, the impulse behind the growth of sustainable and responsible investing. Um, it, it's not inherently there. I think that it's a, I think that in many cases, it's actually a mismatch of understanding from the, the buyer of that fund or the person who invests in that fund or the person who buys the shares of that company, their personal perception of what positive social environmental management or change looks like and what the actual fund claims to do. I think that there's a mismatch often in expectations around what's achievable, what the fund has disclosed that it's doing and what people think they're buying. So I think a lot of the uh, noise around greenwashing is actually goes back to a lack of understanding of how the data works, like the underlying data that you can get about companies or get from companies about environmental and social metrics. And then what you can then do with that in an investment process at scale. Uh, and then frankly, what's even available to you in different asset classes. I think that there's a lot of a, 
education that still needs to happen in the market, as well as a lot of standardization of the metrics uh, that's happening. Um, that's a regulated conversation that's very live right now. The standardization of ESG disclosure metrics, which will make all of this stuff easier to communicate and easier for companies to just focus on disclosing. Um, so I guess I'm, you know, I, I understand the greenwashing concern, but I actually think a lot of it is, um, there's some, some of it is happening uh, among companies and among um, investors as, you know, a marketing ploy or maybe disingenuously, but I actually think a lot of it's actually happening because there's a mismatch, misalignment of expectations. Joanne was making a comment, you mentioned ESGs, and he said ESG and spiritual capital. Have you been able to find a connection there? I think that, uh, well, first of all, I, I actually have a little bit of an issue with the term capital generally. So I think that uh, the term capital, and I, I have to face this a lot, you know, human capital, natural capital. And, and, and one of the things I really think that we need to be careful about in our discourse is why does everything have to be turned into capital so that we can then actually think about it or deal with it? And is this, and I'm posing it as a question, I don't necessarily have the answer, but is this concept of capital actually reflecting that the concept of capitalism, which is essentially taking resources extracting profit and returning, you know, giving out less than the, the owner of that asset can extract, is, uh, is that, has that become so ingrained in the way we see the world that everything has to be a form of capital so that we can then integrate it into the way we think? So I just want us to pause and think about that because um, I'm not sure that we should be thinking about human beings as a, as a source of capital. But with all of that said, uh, certainly, uh, if we think about the idea of, I guess, resources or the idea that there is a, a source of value, there are, there are um, elements that provide a source of value and that source of value can be turned into another source of value for someone else, right? It can be transformed, it can be distributed. Um, so certainly I think the idea of spiritual resources, I think there is a... Um, a uh, I think that there is a, a lot of kind of alternative language used for what I think is underlying that as a spiritual impulse or a spiritual concept, like um, attention, uh, retention and motivation of employees and creating a meaningful workplace for employees. And I see a lot of discussion around uh, from management teams in my own experience and then also in business discourse about how do we, how do we keep people, how do we keep people um, engage with their communities? How do we create, uh, a, what is the social purpose of a corporation? So this concept of stakeholder capitalism to me is an attempt to translate what I think is fundamentally a spiritual principle of the interconnectedness of all things and the interdependence of all things, all forms of life and all, the, all of these resources that is a way of trying to translate that idea of interconnectedness into a concept that I think in a capitalist system we can start to engage with and interact with. So I don't see this term spirituality or spiritual capital being used very much, but I see a lot of proxy concepts um, emerging right now, which I think is very exciting. I think we're in a very fertile time where the kind of very... Um, transactional or extractive forms of entities relating to one another, I think is being questioned at pretty deep levels. Really, you're visibly very happy with where you are now. <laughs> I've said yeah. it a few times. Yeah. What is your greatest challenge now? What is it that, that, that worries you actually about, about the way things are done around you? Oh, that is such a good question. So um, I'm happy today, Mahmoud. <laughs> there are other days when it's certainly very challenging. Um, I, am, I worry about, um, I actually have a lot of, um, I actually, I will admit to this, I have quite a bit of climate depression right now. So I am feeling like it's been, I've been working really hard for 11 years in this field. And I've seen a lot of incredible movement and progress faster than I could have imagined in terms of 
the amount of money that's now being applied to climate problems, um, the amount of kind of commitments being made by really large organizations, both in the investment industry and in, among corporates that you would have never imagined even two or three years ago, like the number of companies that have made ambitious carbon reduction or greenhouse gas reduction targets, or they've committed to aligning their business with net zero. And there's a whole kind of academic community and scientific community around figuring out what are the metrics and how do you measure that? And what are the scenarios, blah, 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 blah. But I do, I, I do feel like it's still not happening fast enough uh, to avert a lot of troubles for humanity in the post 2030 era. And that's very much within sight uh, for all of us from where we stand today. And it is a critical decade. And I, I do worry that um, while I believe that every organization has its role to play, that we're still not able to coordinate fast enough to avert the, some of the worst impacts. So I'm sorry if I don't have a very positive message around that right now, but it is actually something that I'm, I'm worried about. And that's why forums like this are so important because I think trying to infuse the, um, infuse the culture and, of business and uh, to influence um, thought among business leaders uh, to be more integrated, to be looking at these long-term systemic risks, to be, figuring out how we can collaborate together more effectively is so important. Yeah, is your organization, Emily, um, set up, as I, I noted in my commentary one, Lawrence Miller's book, Spiritual Enterprise, how trying, so there's a, a statement of, we don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. Mm. So our systems right now that are in play are extraction-based pretty much across mm. the globe. The org charts of that pyramid structure that's top down do not build itself for consultation. Yes. Whereas the concentric circles that we build in our own communities, that, that's where I'm finding is the challenge is uprooting that org chart system and getting the person who might be head of a company to be that channel, to be the flow point and not necessarily the sole decision maker. Are, are, are you seeing different pressures in the industry to force different changes in organization charts? I'm absolutely seeing pressure on organizational cultures. Um, I don't think that there's, I haven't seen really radical changes in org charts as such um, for the most part, but I, I would say that I think organizational culture is shifting to be much more consensus driven, consultative, um that it just has to be because if there's i think with and i think COVID is really the, the the experience if you're a knowledge worker of being at home uh for the last two years and and not being able to have um go into an office where all of the office related hierarchies kind of get reinforced i think it's been a great equalizing force for a lot of uh, a lot of organizational cultures i think it's also been really hard to build human relationships with, you know, employee turnover. So I think culture is under pressure from a lot of different forces, technological opportunities for digital nomads. You know, it's more possible now to start your own business and to thrive off that than ever before. Um, I think also people are really reevaluating what a meaningful life looks like in the context of COVID and the suffering that's facing us collectively as humanity. And that's also driving different choices. So I think as a result, to the extent that organizational culture needs to respond so that people feel listened to, heard, um, people of, of diverse backgrounds. There's a lot of interest in making sure that teams are diverse, either not just kind of visually diverse, but also cognitively diverse. And there's a lot of interest in how do we create information sharing or decision-making models that really tap into the best talents of everyone. Um, I think some of the forces that operate against a more consultative, you know, circular form of organization is, um, you know, the need to perform and deliver tangible financial results still on a fairly short quarterly timeframe for larger public companies. And so I think it takes a long time to build that consultative culture and for it to be effective. And therefore, you kind of never, I think it's, it's easy to see how organizations ever really get around to it because they're under constant pressure to perform. 
But I would really recommend um, the work of Laylee Miller Muro from the Tahari Justice Center because uh, she's just stepped down as the um, from working for Tahari full time, but she has developed a lot of quite sophisticated thinking about how to run an organization across different sites. In, in her case, it was national. They had large operations in different locations. How to run it in a way where you've got the appropriate uh, types of decisions being consulted on at the appropriate level at the appropriate time. Uh, yes, I, I'm trying to figure out how to uh, minimize the effect of mononumerosis. One of the things that made it appealing to a lot of management was the ability to put things in financial terms. So it took all this stuff and put dollars on it. And then, of course, that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is that people said, oh, so that's the game we're playing now. And they figured out how to game that system. And so I'm just wondering, is this idea, your, your, Emily, you mentioned capitalism and, and tagging all kinds of different uh, descriptors, on different types of capitalism. Is that similar or could it go down a similar path? And how can we, how can we help to cause that to be more enlightened and be guided more by spiritual principles like some of the chat comments that we've had? I think that's such an insightful comment. Thanks, Phil. That is one of the, the challenges I worry about also is once you've called it capital, then you can price it. Let's, and there's a lot of focus on figuring out, well, what's the true price of just carbon? You know, that is still a challenge today, but then what's the true price of, you know, this level of turnover to the organization or all these different things. And, and some of the adverse in, uh, in outcomes or, or unintended outcomes, I would say, of pricing things is that they can then just be written off as a cost. And so, uh, the outcome may be if the, if the subject of, of analysis is the individual company and you're looking at the individual company's um, you know, uh, financial statements and you can say, well, here's a cost, I'm willing to just write that cost off, well, that's just a cost of doing business. Um, if that can very easily happen if you don't have a broader framework uh, of, a, of, I suppose, goal, set, goal setting for humanity. Um, so one of the things that I think is really powerful about the Paris Agreement is that it has, for the, for the first time really, established this is the global carbon budget we have. You know, there's a science that underpins the temperature rise commitment or goal of the Paris Agreement. The science is basically that there's X amount of uh, greenhouse gas parts per million in the atmosphere today, and we need to stop it from getting this high in order to avoid catastrophic climate change. And so that essentially, that gives you a number. And that number, and it's a collective number for all of, all of the world. It's not just a number for that an individual company. And that gives you a number that you can then break down to a country allocation and an industry allocation. You can get down to that. What is the alignment of this company with the projected temperature rise? Now, the science is still very imperfect. And I think in some ways it's a, I think in many ways it can be an imperfect, um, it can be a little bit of a diversion to try to get too scientific about this amount of temperature rises associated with this amount of carbon emissions. And that means this carbon target for this company, because we know with climate change that once you have some of these, um, you know, some of these uh, um, effects that uh, I, I forget the, the term for them um, right now, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, tipping points. Once you hit certain tipping points, the system becomes unstable. You don't know how it's going to react. But the point is that I think it's given humanity a beacon. It's given everyone a goal. Say, okay, we need to collectively work together to, to bring the temperature down. And I think uh, some of the work that's being done um, that I know Arthur Dahl is leading, uh, uh, that coming out of the last uh, conference of the parties uh, for the for, um, for uh, the climate conference of the parties at Glasgow is focused on how do we come up with a global system of accounting around some of these systems. And I think that kind of work is really important to happen in parallel with the bottom up, here's one company, here's their kind of list of disclosures, their individual metrics. We as investors take those metrics, put it in the system. We might start to build models around that, which is the bottom up work. I think these two things need to meet top down and bottom up. 
Emily, I just uh, question mine itself. Maybe it's a little bit off center, but it's about young people and the next coming 20 to 30 years. Because as you know, I'm sure we're looking at existential crisis in many different fields coming in the 20, 30 years about young children. How do we look at them? Because sometimes I think we should be telling them that the trans transformation is needed and they need to think of life a little bit different than the life, for example, that I lived in the last 50 years around the world. Have you thought much about that? I, I do think about it. Uh, I think about it in relation to my nephew and my niece, who are uh, five and one and a half, respectively. <laughs> and I think about what the world's going to look like uh, in 2030 and in 2050 and beyond, and they'll be alive. Not what what are they really inheriting? Um, and I don't know if I have a great answer for you, Gary, because uh, I don't think anyone has a crystal ball. But I do think that everything we can do to raise the next generation of individuals who understand the interconnectedness of all things, um, who are extremely not only intellectually capable and tapping into all of the intellectual capacities that we don't normally tap into given our current education system, but not only their intellectual capacities, but also their uh, emotional and spiritual capacities so that they can be fully, truly integrated human beings. I, I see the future as really needing people who are fully integrated in themselves. And I think that is actually still quite a profound and challenging concept. Uh, I, don't, I don't actually see that very much around me, like people who you know, ha are fully integrated in terms of their emotional, their EQ as well as their IQ. And maybe you can add SQ to that as well, spiritual <laughs> quotient um, uh, as well. Because as, I just don't see how we're going to need a lot of creativity to solve mass migrations, border issues, uh, kind of the role of technology in human identity. Like we, we have so many um, kind of issues coming at us that need creative solutions and not the solutions from the past. So it's a very general answer. I haven't thought about it in a lot of detail, to be honest, because I, I, don't, I don't know what the next 30 years will hold, but I would say that I'm worried. I'm trying, trying to uh, do whatever I can to, um, at least on a personal level, be able to say to my niece and nephew, well, I really tried. And I really tried in the systems that were available, that I was operating in and the tools that were available to me uh, to, to give you something to work with here. But, <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, before we wrap up, the time, time is flying and so many uh, interesting questions still. Uh, coming through. I, I wonder if you have any question for, for the audience before we wrap up. But my question is, is just, you know, what, what, are, what actions are people taking? We've talked about kind of dire crises facing the world and how I'm interested to hear from this group, what, what actions are you taking, uh, whether it's through your work or through other fields of endeavor uh, to respond to that in the way that, and how have you felt, how have you thought through those choices? And, and, and formulated those actions as meaningful for you. Yeah, I actually just stepped into a new, uh, my, my first career here in Europe where I'm uh, originally from Shanghai, China and studying here in the new continent. <laughs> um, well, I, I actually, uh, it's been a challenge and also fascinating um, um, experience, I would say in the last uh, couple of years here, that what you think that prompts one to step into change into the unknown instead of living in a state of comfort or establishment or established life and what actually you view as a source of change for a person and towards a person who probably avoid change and prefer to, to live in a, in a very kind of static mindset and actually, what do you think that's the tipping point or uh, prompts one to embrace change? Oh, man, it's such a deep question. Um, I wish I knew the answer to that. I feel like I don't have many answers to many of the questions today. But I mean, if I just reflect on my own life, I would say what I, I felt a, um, a deep impatience with the state of the world and wanted to, you know, and there was maybe a sense of adventure as well in terms of moving into a 
situation where I really didn't have much support or really any contacts when I moved to China, Beijing. Uh, but it was really much motivated by this uh, orientation towards the future. So I had a very high conviction that China was going to be the most important kind of cultural, political, economic influence on the world in the 21st century. Um, I found that really fascinating. I also found China to be a very misunderstood element. Um, I had the opportunity to study Chinese history, uh, 20th century history, which is amazing, like so interesting and fascinating. And I just thought, I want to go there and just know what that's all about. <laughs> so, so there was an element of, I guess, just conviction that this was going to be important. I didn't know what it was going to look like. But there was, a, I guess, a bit, I suppose an element of faith that... I think people who are change oriented have a, an aspect of faith that if you take one step forward, the next step will become clear, especially if you take that step with the right intentions and with a pure motive. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a, maybe it's a form of courage, maybe it's a form of, um, I don't know, change orientation, but I think, I, I suppose I'm describing behaviors more than the reasons why, but, um, in my own life, that, that's been a big motivator. Like what's next? Just like interest, I'm just interested in what's next. I'm interested in what the world's gonna look like. And I want to know what my role is in that. So yeah, I don't know if that's a great answer for you, Nan, but. Um, yeah, I actually see you as also explorer and actually have also the source of strength and light inside, which actually prompts you to move forward into the darkness or the unknown which I find it actually must coming down probably from your childhood or your upbringings and how actually you were raised up and gives you such kind of strengths. Definitely, yeah. I think encouraging people, encouraging people who are trying something new, doing something different or against the grain, just experimenting. I think that's such a, it's, un, it's an underutilized resource or an underutilized source of capital, encouragement capital, uh, because I think, Definitely, I don't think I would have been able to do this if I didn't have that uh, inner sense of calm or an inner sense of um, that things would be okay in the long run. And it does give you some, I guess, resources to take risks, which I think is part of a change orientation. Thank you, Emily, for sharing. Uh, but I would like to conclude asking you practically how do you infuse those thoughts to your, uh, your peers, to your colleagues, to your team? Are you able to influence them? And how do you practically do that on a day-to-day -day basis? And how, how do you manage to keep them engaged socially and spiritually and to make them believe in something that goes beyond profit uh, per se? Yeah, I think, um, I think storytelling is really important, like celebrating, celebrating wins, um, you know, helping people feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. Um, you know, fostering that collaborative culture where, you know, your purpose at work is not only your own kind of success, whether that's measured through compensation or title, but it's about the broader goals of the organization. And that's why I think aligning yourself with an organization where you can really get behind the goals and the, the kind of ethos of that organization which is partly its history, partly its leadership, partly what it publicly says, what's the public narrative of that organization. I think that's really important because you want to be able to, people to be able to easily plug into something they can believe in.